morning and welcome to worship at Madeira Silverwood Presbyterian Church. I am Tom Sweets and I'm glad you are joining us today. This is Sunday, November 22nd, and it's the week of Thanksgiving. And we will focus on Thanksgiving today and the theme of Thanksgiving. And today we're going to focus on the miracle of Thanksgiving. What happens when you give thanks, whether in a situation of plenty and, and, and goodness or whether in a situation of difficulty and poverty, we can give thanks to the Lord in all of the seasons of our life. Listen to the psalmist who says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever, and with my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one, and I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Friends, the blessings of our life and the blessings from generation to generation come from the Lord God in heaven. And this is who we come to worship this day. So come into the presence of the Lord, in the privacy of your room or on your computer, uh, while you're out for a walk or wherever you might be as you join us online, come to worship the Lord. Amen. Friends, our Old Testament scripture lesson comes to us from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, beginning in verse 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are his holy dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, O you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, as a call to offering, even though you're watching online, I want to remind you that the needs of Madeira Silverwood Presbyterian Church are met only by the gracious, gracious and joyful contributions of those who participate with us in worship, of those who support our work. And when you support the work of Madeira Silverwood Presbyterian Church, you're supporting the work of fine people like Stephen Iyer, who is our theologian and scholar in residence. You're supporting the work of Russell Smith, who will be joining our staff on January 6th. You're supporting the work of missionaries in the Middle East and missionaries in the Far East and missionaries in Europe. And we have one particular missionary that we support who works diligently uh, to help convert those uh, that have been raised in other faiths to the Christian faith. Uh, there's so many things that we're doing. You are supporting the ministry to youth and a ministry to children. You're supporting music ministry 
uh, and choirs and bell choirs and praise teams. You're supporting all of these works that God would be lifted up and be praised. And every Sunday morning, we seek to praise and honor the Lord. Every Sunday, we seek to reorient our lives around God. So bring your full tithe into the storehouse of God so there might be rich blessings for many. If you'd like to pledge this year and to give, please call the church office 513-791-4470 and ask Donna uh, to send you a pledge card and to send you a pledge envelope so that you may help and support the work of the church. God bless you and thank you for your offerings, for your tithes and your generous giving. Amen. in prayer. Dear Lord, open your word to us and speak to us of eternal things. Comfort us by your, by your uh, scripture, by your word. Lead and strengthen us into the life of Christians. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, we're coming into Thanksgiving week, and it's going to be a special week as um, as Irma Bombeck says, it takes about 18 hours to cook a Thanksgiving dinner, and it takes about 12 minutes to eat it. Uh, suspiciously, she says, about the same time as they allow for halftime in the NFL. Well, I hope we have a good Thanksgiving day and, uh, and gathering family together. And in this season of, of COVID-19, maybe, maybe some of our meals will be smaller, and some of you might even be more alone on this Thanksgiving. But let's be encouraged and strengthened through the word of God. 
Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And he said that if you are a light of the world, don't, don't hide your light under a bushel basket, but let it be seen by all people. Now, what is a light in the world? What is A, a light is something that shines bright in, even in the midst of darkness. Something that gives us joy in the midst of uh, sadness or difficulty. And part of being a light in the world is to be a thankful person. And I want you to see today how being a thankful person will transform a dark and difficult world. When you are stable in the midst of earth-shaking times, when you're able to see what God is up to in the course of history, even when it looks like things are not going well, even when it looks like the world is falling apart, then you are a light in a dark world. When you can honor God in the midst of grief or loss, the death of a loved one, the loss of a, a job or a position or maybe even a calling, when you're able to see what God is up to in the midst of your grief and you can be thankful to God, then you are a light in a desperate world. When the light of your life can shine in a dark world, you bring illumination to the path of many. When in all circumstances you can give thanks, and this is the passage we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when in all circumstances you can give thanks, you become a person that's a transformative person in our world. So for the Christian, thanksgiving is the act of giving thanks to God in good circumstances, in everyday ordinary circumstances, and in difficult circumstances. Giving thanks creates a dynamic where God's hand is moved to work, where your spirit is lifted up, and where other people see the goodness that's happened. I would even say it has a miraculous effect on life when you actually enter into thanksgiving. I think thanksgiving actually opens up uh, uh, miracles from the Lord. The first thing that happens in thanksgiving is the heart of God is changed. The heart of God is changed. Let's say you're a grandparent, as I am, and you give a, a present to a grandchild, and spontaneously, without you saying anything or mentioning anything, maybe it's long after you've given that present, they say, say thank you so much, granddaddy. Thank you so much, grandmother. I appreciate you so much. When they give appreciation to you, what happens in your heart? Your heart is immediately opened up and warmed towards that grandchild. Now, when you give thanks to God, the heart of God is opened up to you and God's compassion towards you is increased. The second thing that happens is when you give thanks, your heart is changed. As you give thanks, you change from being a victim of circumstance and being a victim of difficult things in this world to being a, a thankful person who is making it through the difficult rapids on the river of life uh, to get to the point that's peaceful again. When you give thanks, you trust that God's hand is at work to guide and protect and deliver you. The third thing that happens is the heart of those that are watching you change. It, change. Their hearts change. Because as they're watching you, and they say that you worship God in the every and ordinary days of life, the, the days that we might call drudgery, in the good times of life, and even in the bad and very difficult times, when they say that you are thankful to God in the midst of that, you become a witness. You're offering them something they don't have. If they don't know the Lord, they don't have the ability to give thanks. Without knowing the Lord, uh, the, the opportunity is for you to be a victim of difficult circumstance, a complainer to friends. If there's no God, there's no God to complain to, so you have to complain to friends or family. You can become bitter. And, you're, and, and nothing drives another person away from you more than bitterness. If you're bitter about some event in your past or some circumstance in life, you will drive people away. Now, let's think a little bit about Thanksgiving. I want to give you a little bit of background to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul begins his book of Thessalonians, and you almost could just call this a, a letter of thanks. He begins in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we always thank God for you and continually mention you in our prayers. Paul is thanking God for the people of Thessaloniki. And he's remembering them in prayer. 
Paul says, we're thankful that you decided to imitate us. That would be Paul and Silas and, and other Christians in his traveling group. We are thankful that you are seeking to model your life after us. We are thankful that you've turned from idols to Jesus, who is the one that has risen from the dead. He just starts listing what things can he think about to be thankful for this, these Thessalonians. And in this, I see an example for us. We have to think continually about what can we find to be thankful about. It's easy to find that which we can complain about. Oh, the, the lights went out and I can't watch TV tonight. Oh, uh, my favorite show is canceled. Oh, they didn't call me and it was my birthday. That, that, that uh, person who was bagging my groceries at the grocery store broke the eggs. We can always find something that we can be disgruntled about. But Paul was finding deliberately things to be thankful about. I am thankful, said Paul, that you received my teaching in chapter two. And he wanted to remind them of those key points of his teaching. So that you will speak the gospel and you will face strong opposition even as I did. Now, don't go out and preach the gospel with flattery. That doesn't do any good. Don't get greedy and, and, uh, and, and seek to, to take uh, money for the advice or the ministry that you give. Look for those things which you can praise. Be a holy and righteous people. Encourage and comfort other people. And Paul says he's thankful because they got this lesson. We are thankful because you received the word of God, says Paul. We are thankful that you became imitators, not just of myself and as Silas would say, Paul, but you became imitators of God. And we are thankful that in that imitation of Christ, you have even learned to suffer as Christ suffered. And we can't wait to see you again, says Paul. This is, what he, this is how Paul brings the message to the Thessalonians. It's filled with thanksgiving. Now, my guess is there were plenty of things in, uh, in Thessaloniki for the, pe for the people that lived there to be corrected on. Paul then reminds them in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, We sent Timothy to you, and I know he told you that you would suffer. And I know we're praying for you as you're going through your suffering. So Paul is pointing out that the joy of the life of Christ is often surrounded by uh, temporary and worldly suffering. But he reminds them in chapter 4, please live in order that you might please God. Avoid sexual immorality. Live a life of purity, he says. Love one another. Bind your own business. Work hard with your own hands. When a believer dies, said Paul, they are bound for glory and to be with God. And he even talks about the end times. And he, and he says that at the end times, it's going to be a, a, a shout from an angel and then a trumpet blast. And Christ will come back and the dead in Christ will be raised. And those who have not yet died to be with Christ on that last day, on that culmination of history, they will be raised up into the sky with Christ. And he talks about the end of time. In this, he's saying, don't fear the end of time. Also realize there's a broader sweep of history than just what you see right here and now. Don't forget that the end times are coming, but God has planned for those who believe glory and for those who suffer glory and for those who follow him and are obedient to him glory. As he says, Jesus died and was raised to heaven, so too you will die and be raised unto heaven. Then in chapter 5, he says, by the way, we don't know the times and the date when the world and history will come to an end. We do know that history will reach a point of culmination. And so live as a child of the light. Seek to be obedient to what God commands during all this. Don't be a child of the darkness. Don't go back to your ways of, of sexual impropriety. Uh, don't seek to please the flesh. Don't be greedy. Don't be gossips. Don't be idolaters. But live and serve the one and true living God. Be sober-minded. God has appointed you to receive salvation and to pass this on to all who will receive it. Honor those who work hard among you in their professions or in their ministry. Warn those who are idol worshipers or disruptive. And then he comes to the little phrase, which will be our focus today. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice always. God wants you and God wants me to be happy. He wants us to be happy people. That is rejoicing always. If you can only find a small thing to be thankful in, find that small thing and give thanks in front of other people and be a light to the world. He wants you to be a happy person. This 
is how the gospel is taken into the world. Second, pray continually. Be in constant prayer so that you might understand some of the difficulties and the difficult circumstances that happen in our world today. Be constant in prayer, not just in the sanctuary, not just in your uh, uh, private room for prayer, but be constant in prayer as you're walking through Kroger's, as you're going to the mall to do your Christmas shopping, as you're driving to the doctor's office or picking the kids up at school. Be in prayer. And then finally, give thanks in all circumstances. And this is what brings us to the principle of thanksgiving. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. So uh, we pray uh, constantly and we give thanks in all circumstances. This is what Paul says. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So I call this the miracle of thanksgiving or the miracle of, of the thanksgiving attitude, the miracle of thanksgiving thinking. God will change your life through thanksgiving. And in this way, it's miraculous. When you give thanks, your life has changed. The focus comes off of yourself. When you give thanks, the focus comes off of yourself. When you give thanks, the focus comes off of your particular predicament or situation. When you give thanks, the focus goes to another and in the case of the Christian, the focus goes to God the Father, God in heaven. The God who called you and made you. The God who protects you and loves you. When we look to God in thanksgiving, we look beyond our current difficulties or even our current successes. We look beyond tragedy and we look beyond sinful behavior. And we look into the eyes of God. We take the focus off ourselves. we take the focus off our situation, we take the focus off other people and we give the focus to God. I was talking with Stephen Iyer this week and he said, Tom, C.S. Lewis says that sin is really a very simple thing. Anything that we call sin can be described as being self-centered. So the truth is, we need to take the focus off of ourselves. In the end, we either say, my will be done, or thy will be done. And when we say, thy will be done, we're putting the focus on God. And we're giving God the power and the strength and the praise and our adoration. A person who turns to God with a thankful spirit is saying, thy will be done. And is saying, I will be content in all circumstances that you have placed in my life. I trust that you're in control, God. I trust that history is guided by your hand. Now let's think of a few situations where Thanksgiving needs to transform our lives. One situation where Thanksgiving can transform your life is your marriage. Let's say there's one thing that's really bothering you about your spouse. Now instead of a constant focus on the one thing that is really bothering you, you find 10 things to give thanks to God about for them. Let's say your spouse is too loud or talks too much. Well, you can say, God, I'm so thankful that she married me anyway. God, I'm thankful that he gave me children and we have children in our family. God, I'm thankful that she planned such nice trips and is so thoughtful in the way that she decorates the house. God, I'm thankful that he leads in so many good conversations and you see, as you replace a criticism with thanksgiving, the criticism begins to fade. I hate to say how often I've heard of difficulties in marital relationships where there's been one problem. One person hasn't been able to get past one problem. If you can give thanks to God for 10 things, then the one problem is just one thing out of 10. So Thanksgiving can transform your marriage in a miraculous way. Can, Thanksgiving can change your career. Let's say you don't like your boss. It's hard to get along with your boss. Your boss might be someone that's short-tempered, difficult to understand. Maybe your boss is under a lot of pressure. The first Thanksgiving you could give, instead of, instead of just focusing on how bad your boss is, you could say, dear God, I'm so thankful I don't have all the pressures that my boss has. Instead of a constant focus on what's wrong with your boss, you can say, I'm so thankful, Lord, that I have a job. 
I'm thankful, Lord, that I uh, get reimbursed for mileage or the, the company provides me a car. I'm thankful that it's a good place to work. I'm thankful that it's a nice building. I think that what we create a good product. I'm thankful, God, for the good people that I work around. I'm thankful that our, our company has a softball team and I get to play softball in the summertime. What can you think of? If you have one difficulty at work, take that one difficulty. Okay, you can talk to the Lord and you can complain to God about that. But add to that one difficulty 10 things that you're thankful for and it will miraculously change your work. By the way, your boss's boss might want you to take your boss's position someday. And if all you do is complain about your boss, then he will turn away from you because people, as I said, bitterness repels people, but thanksgiving is like a magnet. When you're a thankful person, people want to thank, find out what's going on in your life. Thanksgiving can change the way you parent. Sometimes parents want too much of a level of perfection in their children. Uh, maybe they want their children to be perfect in a way that they were never perfect. But when you start to be thankful, oh, Lord, I'm thankful for little Billy, even though he's so active and he, and he wears me out. I'm thankful, Lord, that he's so anxious to learn at school. Or I'm thankful that he's so cute. Or I'm thankful that he's such a good athlete. Find things that are good. I'm thankful for little Susie. And I worry about her and I worry for these, these things in her life. But Lord, I'm so thankful that she's so cute when we get her dressed up on Sunday morning. I'm thankful for these little comments that she makes. I'm thankful for the violets that she picked in the yard this spring and brought in and gave to me as a present. Find, for every complaint you have, find 10 things to be thankful for. If you do this in any area of your life that upsets you right now, you will move from... Uh, being a single, solitary, uh, bitter person into being a thankful person that can be the light of the world. Now, when you're a victim, you must complain. We have a, we have a, a huge political movements built out of victimhood and, and, and to, to gain power, causing people to complain and to be victims. But we ought to think about, and particularly in our body politic, of those things that we are thankful for. If you're a victim, then you must complain and you must find someone to sympathize with you and you must speak about it and you must bring them into a state of complaint as you claim to seek justice. If, however, you are a thankful person, you can turn to God and say, God, I know you will handle this. I know you will take care of this problem. I will put this problem in your hands and God will change your world as he changes it through thanksgiving. Remember what happens when you're thankful. The first thing you do is warm the heart of God. And the next thing you do is take your focus off of yourself and then you trust your world into God's hands. We can be thankful even when the circumstances of life can be difficult. And isn't that what Thanksgiving Day is all about? In 1608, a group of Protestant believers that called them, were called separatists, they called themselves saints, left Nottinghamshire, England, and went to Leiden, Holland to escape the limitations that were put on them and by the Church of England. They wanted to worship in freedom. They wanted to escape the corruption and idolatry they saw in the church, and that church led them to flee. But life in Holland had its own set of difficulties. They weren't accepted as a people. Of course, they were foreigners. Um, they, they were craft guilds, we would call those unions today, that didn't allow them to get the good jobs. They just worked in menial labor. There were other difficulties. So they returned to England, and they were in Plymouth, England, and they sought passage to this place that they had heard of, this new world. And in August of 1620, a group of about 40 of these saints and uh, with a few other uh, people, some other, about 60 other strangers, uh, all got on the ship and they headed to the New World. They got on two merchant ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. But the Speedwell, as they were headed out, uh, began to leak and they had to turn around on their trip and it delayed their trip quite a lot. And then they had to cram all the people from the two ships into one ship. The one ship was only 80 feet long and 24 feet wide, 80 feet long. It's only capable of carrying 180 tons of cargo. The Mayflower set sail under the direction of Captain Christopher Jones. But because of the delay, they crossed the Atlantic in the height of the storm season, and the journey was horribly unpleasant. One of the passengers was swept over, overboard. Uh, others were terribly sick. Some were sick almost the entire trip. And the, the Mayflower carried these passengers, 102 of them, to give them a start in the new world. Now, 57 
of the 102 immigrants aboard the Mayflower survived the first winter. 45 didn't. The first winter. Then, of course, they got into the spring. Uh, fortunately, uh, the, the Mayflower community was able to convince the captain to uh, harbor his ship there at Plymouth through the winter so that he could journey back at a safer time. And it's a good thing they did because they built a longhouse by which, in which they all could live. And even though many of them were sick, eventually the longhouse burned down in January and they had to retreat to the ship for shelter. But eventually, these ones that we call the pilgrims, after losing half of their number, after going through a devastating journey and tremendous disappointments, they declared a Thanksgiving day. And friends, that's what we celebrate today. Now hear the words of Jesus. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Light and thanksgiving emerged from these people. Light and thanksgiving. What happened? They were giving thanks to God. And what happened? The heart of God was warmed towards them. And the heart of God was compassionate towards them in a new and more dynamic way. Second, a change took place in their heart. They were now living by faith. Even though they'd met terrible tragedies and multiple disappointments, they were now giving thanks for those good things they could find. And third, a miracle was happening. There were others watching them. And we're still watching today. Thanksgiving in the midst of success gives credit where credit is due. Thanksgiving in the midst of difficult times is a witness to your faith and to the world. Thanksgiving during the midst of the everyday and ordinary stresses becomes a confession to God. Thanksgiving changes everything and it is a miracle of faith. Amen. Now, I want you to remember the miracle of thanksgiving. We give thanks when our circumstances are good and we give God the glory and the honor. We give thanks when we're in difficult circumstances. We give thanks in the everyday and ordinary days of our life. As we make thanksgiving a part of our life, we look upon other people with compassion. We find what is good about them and what we can thank the Lord for. Instead of looking for the faults of others, we look for those things we can praise God for. In the midst of our circumstance, we praise God for the good and the bad circumstance. In all things and in all circumstances, we give God thanksgiving. Friends, as you enter this Thanksgiving week, enter into the miracle of thanksgiving. Calm your heart before the Lord 
and give him your worship and praise. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.